just because we have a lot of people who like to uh, to watch these sessions after the fact. So, um, so we like to have them recorded. But um, I'd like to welcome everybody to um, our latest installment of the Iowa OER webinar series. These are semi-regular information sessions that we hold for people working on various types of OER projects, both in Iowa and beyond. And um, I do want to mention if you if you have any topics of interest that you'd like to see covered in these webinars, you can always send us a chat through the Iowa OER Google group. Um, I'll post the link to that to that group as well as our website and a few other um, things as we get started here. My name is Mariah Burnett and I'm the scholarly communications librarian at the University of Iowa. And I'm also a member of the Iowa OER Action Team. And today, what we're going to be learning about is open math homework systems. So oftentimes, when we talk to math teachers and math professors, um, we find that a major barrier to the adoption of OER in that discipline is a lack of free, open, and online homework systems to accompany textbooks. And um, luckily, there are some, some great solutions available, which is what we're going to be talking about today. I am joined by, um, by three, possibly four, educators who have used and or developed open math systems using MyOpenMath, SageMath, and WebWork um, platforms. So um, we're joined today by David Lippman from Pierce College in Washington State, Bruce Ayati from the University of Iowa, and Gavin LaRose from the University of Michigan. We may be also joined by Christian Rutger from Iowa State. Um, so this will be a panel discussion with each participant kind of giving a brief presentation about their involvement with open math homework systems. And then we can um, spend some time asking our panelists questions about the projects that they've been involved with. So before we start the presentations, I'd like each of our speakers to give a brief introduction. Um, you know, you could just give your, your name and your role and kind of what you're going to be speaking about today. So um, could we start with Bruce? So I uh, will have the least expertise in that the uh, only thing I'm bringing to the table is a failed attempt to try to get my department to adopt uh, web work. Um, and so I guess when the time comes, we could talk about what some of the impediments within that uh, the department were to, to moving forward. Uh, but yeah, I'm in the mathematics department at the University of uh, Iowa. Great. Next, let's hear from Gavin. I think you may be on mute, Gavin. Okay, is that better? Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Every once in a while, my Zoom decides not to peek to the talk to the microphone. Um, so my name is Gavin Rose, still, or again, um, and uh, I'm at the University of Michigan, and my role there is actually split in to two, but the part of my role there, which is most relevant here, is that I'm the director of the instructional technology uh, that we use at, in the department. And so we actually have a dedicated position or half position for that, which is very useful. Um, and so I've been running web work at Michigan for quite a long time now, and I've been sort of also working with a lot of the other instructional technology stuff we have going on here. Um, and then I'm also, as of this spring, the um, president of the WebWork project, which is the nonprofit that supports the WebWork development and everything as well. So I'm here sort of from both of those perspectives. Great, thank you. And then finally, let's hear from David Lippman. Hi, I'm David Lippman. I uh, teach math at Pierce College in Lakewood, Washington. And I am the lead developer and system administrator and president of the nonprofit for my open math. Excellent. So um, I think what we'll do today is uh, each speaker will, will spend a little time talking about their individual projects. So who would like to go first? <laughs> if nobody has any strong preferences, I'll just um, pick somebody at random. So can we start with you, Gavin? I would be happy to go first. Excellent. Um, excellent. So let me see if I can share a presentation that I have working around here somewhere. Hopefully that works. Um, I see nobody complaining, so we'll assume it is. Um, excellent. So this is a quick overview of what WebWork is, has been, and where it's going. Um, and I've already told you all about myself, so I won't say more there. And so I'm going to say a little bit about the history behind WebWork, because I think it's interesting to see how these things have developed and the connections we've got with a variety of other sort of projects and um, organizations. 
look a little bit about what web work itself actually does and sort of the context in which it functions and then look forward and say where we're going to because I think um, it's sort of nice to know that things aren't static and are moving forward. So the origin and premise, right? The web work started in 1996 at the University of Rochester, which is disturbingly a long time ago at this point. Um, and it was developed by Mike Gage and Arnie Pizer originally. Um, Mike is the one in the top and Marnie's, Marnie's the one in the bottom picture. And so for context, this is when Netscape and Internet Explorer were the dominant web browsers. And it's only a year after the Apache web server was released, which um, is now the absolute dominant web server everywhere. And uh, so it, there's a very different world that it started in. But the premise that Mike and Arnie started with was of developing an online math homework system. And it was inspired by sort of largely two different resources or uh, software projects, one of which was Kappa, which was an online system for, um, I believe, physics homework. And if I'm remembering correctly, it started at Michigan State. Um, and by Tech and LaTeX, which are sort of the de facto standard for typesetting mathematics in a lot of mathematical uh, spaces. And Tech and LaTeX have been quite reasonably described as programming languages that allow you to typeset. Um, and so they are quite sophisticated and they allow an incredible amount of precision in what you're able to typeset and how good it looks. And this idea was very much behind the idea of the of web work and what Mike and Arnie started with is this idea that we want something that's powerful enough to ask the questions that we want to want, want to ask, not just the ones that are easy. Um, and so the emphasis from the outset has been on capability, not necessarily simplicity, although I contend that it's not all that difficult to run web work, but I won't claim that it's the easiest system out there either. Um, so the development has gone through a number of big milestones. In mid 2000s, we went from Web Work 1 to Web Work 2, which um, sort of moved into a more modern database structure and interface. Um, the, there were a number of development workshops that happened in the course of the 2000s. I'm going to highlight the one at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, where we added a bunch of things, including the JS Math, I believe, went in there, Math Objects. And so this is a lot of the underlying power in, math, in uh, web work comes from the ability to render problems well and have a nice equation that you can see. Um, the math objects or the uh, libraries that underlie the system that allow us to check a lot of the um, mathematical problems that we want to check and sort of understand what is mathematically equivalent to something else in a sensible manner. And then the quiz test module was developed in the early 2000s as well. Um, and that was, I was involved with a good bit of that development. And then in the mid 2000s, the problem library got developed, and then as we started moving a little further, we got more documentation in as, quite, as well. As of 22 this summer, um, WebWork 2.17 is a release candidate, and it will be out sometime this summer. So we are 17 iterations past 2004. Um, and then WebWork 3 is under active development. I'll say just a teeny bit about that um, as well as we go forward. And that's sometime in the next year or so. We expect to see that coming out as well. As of June 2020, um, there were over 1,300 institutions using web work. This is our map of where the institutions are. And one of the things I think is very cool is we've got most of the continents represented at this point. We've got actually pretty good international uh, coverage here. Um, the National Problem Library has been rebranded the Open Problem Library because it's not national anymore, it's international. And uh, its current size is somewhere over 35,000 problems. And that's primarily mathematics, but there are um, some other fields that are represented there as well. Um, we continue to be an open source project and we continue to be uh, supported by a nonprofit organization. Actually, the nonprofit part of that we've only just uh, established. So as of 2.17, WebWork supports a bunch of things. From the outset, the idea had been that we should be able to present a unique problem set for every user that comes in. Um, and this is done by parameterizing things and having uh, a flexible presentation and, and how things are done. Um, it's got a very nice equation editor. We use the sort of what I think is the industry standard at this point, which is MathJax. Um, and as of a couple of um, versions ago, uh, what is really quite a nice equation editor. So I've put an image here, which may or may not be visible, but um, the answer box there is what the student sees as they're entering the problem, which is really quite nice at this point. Um, it's always supported image embedding and creation of graphs um, for mathematics and science problems. Um, and increasingly has additional support for things like Pixie as a package out of LaTeX. And so it enables you to embed the instructions for creating a, a problem rather than having the um, traditional code or embedding a static image. 
And then we also have just, as of 2.17, introduced the interactive uh, graphing problem so that you can have a problem that the student's actually able to interact with in a, a sensible manner. Yeah. It's always had automatic problem grading because that's the whole point of an online homework <laughs> system. If you're going to do online homework, you ought to have it grade it for you. Um, and it's a very uh, flexible uh, system that can more or less do any problem that you can sort of see a mathematical way that you can check it, web work can figure out how to do that for you. Um, its accessibility is really quite good, not least because it's a relatively old school interface still, but also MathJax is a very good system for um, trying to make math equations uh, accessible. And overall, a lot of the problems, so not all of the problems that WebWork has in the library um, are really very good in terms of being accessible for screen readers. Um, and then it's got a number of different um, set types. So you can do homework sets, you can do just-in-time sets, which allow the addition of problems for students who are struggling with one problem or another problem. Um, it allows a show me another uh, set where a student can re-randomize -re a problem and see a different version of the same problem if they think they're not quite getting what's going on. And as I mentioned, uh, we also support quizzes and exams. And this is something that we use very heavily at Michigan. Um, we also use the homework piece, but we're also trying to incorporate increasing amounts of mastery assessment in our introductory courses. And the whole point of this sort of quiz exam module is to allow students to take a test or a quiz, but also to retake a different version of it. And so um, the quiz module in web work allows this the idea of setting up a template uh, quiz where each problem may be drawn from a problem bank. And so every version that the student gets may be very, very different. Um, and WebWork also supports interfaces with external systems. So we um, support LTI and so can talk to course management systems. It supports single sign-on through LDAP, Cosigner, Shibboleth, as well as through the uh, course management system through LTI. Um, and also supports grade pass back to course management systems. Um, and then there's also a standalone renderer that allows WebWork problems to be embedded in other OER systems. And Pretext in particular is doing that. Um, and I think LibreText is also, and we're working with Runestone. Um, which I didn't put there, but it shows up on another slide going forward. Um, so with all of that, what Warburg is, <laughs> we are not trying to be a course management system. It's not an online grade book. Um, it's not a system that's the goal is to provide a prescribed solution to some institution who wants a system to do placement testing, right? Michigan uses WebWork for placement testing, but it's a system, we set it up so that we would do what we wanted to do. Um, there are sort of temples, temple courses and template assignments that you can find um, in the system, but the goal is not to provide a um, service that actually does that all that for you. And we're certainly not commercial or for-profit. Um, there are a number of different ways that WebWork can be used. Um, I think for large institutions, the most common is it's that you download the source and you run it on a server in your at your institution. That's what we do at Michigan. Um, and we like this particularly at Michigan because it enables us to um, not charge students. And so there's no fee for using this for the students, which I think is very important. Um, there are a number of hosting options if you're not able to run it um, on your own server. Uh, Runestone and Rationarium offer hosting, which is largely either course by the course or by a department or a set of courses. And so those are, I think, very powerful solutions for departments that want to run something like this but can't run their own server. And so Runestone has a per course charge and Rationarium has a sort of a package deal where you can get a bunch of courses for a single uh, price. Um, and then Edfinity is a commercial um, operation that has taken the WebWork engine and repackaged it so that the interface is much slicker and they have a much closer to a standard commercial model where they're trying to impress students. Um, so with that, where are we going? WebWork is actually under as steady development as I think I have seen in all of the 20 something years we've been using it. It's really moving pretty fast right now. WebWork 3 is coming up, um, hopefully in the next year or so. It's just a complete rewrite of what's going on and it should be much faster and have a much modern, much more modern interface. Um, we have some connections with open educational resources and open textbooks. Um, this includes sort of the at a very simple level, that there are a number of authors who have written active or have wrote open textbooks and they use web work as a here are a bunch of problem sets you can use with the textbook. But we also are trying to build connections with um, people like Pretext and LibreText and reach them. Um, and then we're also trying to develop workshops and co camps to provide both 
uh, opportunities for people who want to figure out how to use web work, but also people who want to contribute back. Um, this was all largely supported by the web work project. This is a nonprofit as of this year, actually, we turned into a nonprofit this year uh, organization. I'm the current president, but a huge amount of work has been done by all of these other people. Um, and the picture there is from a <laughs> math meeting from some while ago when people actually met in person and you could sit around in a bar and um, talk about stuff and see what was going on. Okay, and so that's my quick overview. I'll put this slide up and then I will take it away and you will have to ask me for the information as well. Um, I have my at email address and the uh, URL for the open web work WordPress site as well. Excellent. Thanks very much, Gavin. Does anyone have any questions now before we move on to our next speaker? Okay, let's turn it over to Bruce next, if that's all right. Um, so I recall, Gavin, you came and gave a little talk to a group of us faculty uh, that Cindy had asked you uh, to do. And we made a push to get it through uh, undergraduate committee and the undergraduate committee said, uh, decided that you know, I would be able to present this uh, to the department and at the department level, there was a tremendous amount of pushback. Um, they uh, essentially viewed this as uh, lots and lots of extra work for the faculty uh, that would replace um, you know, these proprietary open education systems that you know, I don't know to what degree that we're, we're really using them, but a few classes here and there really, really need them is my understanding. I've never used them. Um, and the, the challenge within our department, at least, is trying to convince uh, faculty in the department to go to the university in a time of uh, diminished resources, find the resources for a server, because that was the model we were looking at at the time. Um, someone to manage the server, so that meant, you know, a faculty position, versus the much simpler approach of just having, uh, for those courses, uh, students pay a fee as part of their coursework, and that would, um, yeah, and that would take care of whatever system, and it seemed much, much simpler, uh, to the department uh, as a whole. Um, probably there was a, 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 I mean, you know, this is recorded, I'm talking internal pol pol department politics, but this, you know, I'm willing to share. Uh, there was probably a little bit of a generational divide. I think maybe some younger faculty, if I picked it up, but again, these were impressions on my part, no former, formal vote or poll, but um, it does, did seem to be a generational divide on the issue. So perhaps in a few years, uh, there, there might be a more receptive audience. But um, yeah, I was disappointed because I really, from my perspective, um, you know, I'm concerned uh, of having uh, uh, outside vendors do more and more and more of our essential mission. And then uh, we are uh, both can't control the quality of the product to the degree that we want or customize it for our particular uh, student body and culture and the like. Um, but, at, you know, at what point does, you know, do things reach, reach a situation where one of these companies can come in and say, look, we'll actually teach the entirety of your class online and it'll save you a lot of money. Uh, right now, I think because of COVID, that danger is diminished. Um, online learning has proven to be uh, uh, dramatically inferior to in-person um, and the MOOCs are gonna take over everything. Um, where I grew up, MOOC was a derogatory term, so I love calling them that. Uh, <laughs> calling someone with a MOOC was not a, <laughs> was not a nice thing to do. So with, you know, the MOOCs have seemed to sort of hit their their max. And um, I even taught a couple of classes hybrid and they were the worst experiences for both me and the students. And they, they that, that was reflected in my evaluations, which were not on par with before and after. So um, yeah, sorry to ramble a little bit, but uh, that's the main concern from my perspective is to make sure that we control the product. And not the MOOC, not and not get outsourced to a MOOC or, or whatnot, um, primarily. And then the second one is to uh, sort of keep you know the money in in the local ecosystem. Um, you know, whole Jane Jacobs sort of import replacement, right? The more money, and this department doesn't appreciate this. This is too abstract. But the more money that even eighty dollars here, fifty dollars here that gets sent out, you know, trickles back to us as not being able to let's say have enough resources for our own. own work so yeah i uh so the um 
you know, I know it was a for-profit, but maybe that's a bridge between the two where we, we could use maybe a web work for some individual courses where the students pay the course fee for that. And then once we get a critical mass, we could say, look, we have so many people using web work. Why don't we go and have our own server, put in a grant to, you know, our local ITS board and things like that and say, look, we can, um, you know, we can provide this service much cheaper to the students. Um, and this is a good use for the student technology fees. Uh, and maybe that's a, a potential bridge moving forward. Um, so I'm glad that I, that's a reference I have not been aware of uh, since I last talk, uh, thought of this project. So uh, thanks, Gavin, for that. And that's about it. I mean, really, you know, we have two people who really have committed themselves to this endeavor. And then, you know, I guess I'm the local person that's sort of, you know, uh, you know invited to talk. So that's about, you know, the challenges of wider adoption, let's say. And that's about it. So thanks. Yeah, it definitely is a challenging sort of situation. And I, I can attest, you know, working in the same institution as Bruce, he's, he's definitely a big advocate for open math. And we just, we're, we're hoping that these sorts of things will eventually sort of take off. Um, any questions for Bruce before we move on to, to David? So there's a, and did you explore, or was that on the table to look at a, either augmented tech fee or a internal lab fee for, math classes, so that would be another bridge. And I believe that Michigan State actually has a system where they run web work, but there is a web work fee associated with the courses that use it. And it's not very big, um, you know, so even if it's even $5, we do over 9,000 students a year. And if you had $5 a student, that would generate a lot of money. That was so, not something that sort of occurred, you know, to me during the process, but an augmented lab fee might be something to, to also look at rather than the um, proprietary version. Because uh, I know uh, we don't do that directly with anything, but I do know other departments do. Um, and so uh, the mechanism, I, if my, my belief is the mechanism is there and, and to maybe use that. So thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, having said that, I know that at some point somebody mooted it in our department and it got shot down by the administration, even though other science classes do have lab fees, right? And so, but we are able to support it internally. So that wasn't really a huge issue for us. I guess I have a quick question before we transition to a different potential platform. Um, I'm Mary Ann Huey from Drake. Thanks for having this. This is perfect timing for us. I'm just wondering if there are any downsides that people see with Edfinity. Um, we're kind of headed that direction with a pilot in the fall. We use, um, in terms of homework, we, we use uh, WebAssign and like my math lab maybe, but I think mostly it's it's web assigned and, and we mostly are doing in class activities and projects and things like that. So it's just kind of like, I view it as like a third of our kind of package with students. It's not like the primary thing that we do, but it's an important aspect. Are there any downsides associated that anybody knows of with Edfinity? So I would be sure to ask carefully about how easy it is to get content out of Edfinity if you then wanted to shift gears. Um, it's Edfinity runs web work under the hood, so it can use any web work problem or set I believe that you have. Um, I don't know what their licensing and export capability is. So if you said at the end of the day, this is awesome. I want to export all these sets and these problems that we created and take them out. Yeah. Um, it would be worth double checking to see how that works. Okay, thanks. The only other thing I can think to mention is, is if you are using OER, and your faculty are already familiar with WebAssign, it's worth comparing WebAssign's OER pricing to Edfinity's because WebAssign does offer a special pricing when used with OER books that is substantially lower than their commercial pricing. We just we just found out about that yesterday. Um, yeah, so that seems easier, like an easier transition for perhaps for us. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. All right, let's hear from David. Okay, let me find the right window to share here. Um, all right, so uh, like I said, I'm David Lippman. Uh, so my open math was started in roughly 2006. Um, it's kind of funny, it was actually inspired by web work. Um, my story is kind of like, I was looking for a open homework system. I found web work. I was like, wow, this is really cool, but I'm at a two-year college and RIT department is never gonna be willing to support this. 
Um, and so I tried to come up with something that could kind of run on a commodity web server without needing a bunch of installation stuff. Um, and then it evolved. Uh, so it started out here in Washington, and then Washington had this thing called the Open Course Library Project about 10 years ago, where open courses were developed, aligned, uh, sorry, where open courses were developed for a ton of courses, including math. And out of that, we created a bunch of really cool math courses, and then I felt bad that no one outside of Washington was going to be able to take advantage of them. And so I launched my open math to sort of share what we had created in Washington outside, and then it's evolved since then. Uh, so my open math is a free and open uh, homework platform with the primary focus being on making it easy to adopt OER. So our focus, you know, well, well, web work and, and can be used with like any math book and technically we can too, but our focus is really just on supporting the use of OER and trying to make it as easy to adopt OER as it is to adopt a commercial book. And part of that is my open math is a hosted site. Um, again, the software is open source, so a school can self-host if they want to, uh, and there are some schools that choose to do that, uh, but my open math is available for free use uh, for schools who don't want to have to deal with hosting. Um, so part of the way we try to make it easy to adopt is um, so all of our content is user created, uh, like in web work, um, and that includes not only homeworks, like individual problems, but also courses. Uh, and so we've uh, assembled, contributed by users, a bunch of uh, contributed courses aligned with sort of the popular commercial books. Uh, sorry, not commercial books, OER books. Uh, so if you, for example, are saying, oh, I'm going to go teach, you know, I'm interested in the OpenStax uh, pre-calculus, or maybe the college algebra and trig book, one of those, um, there are a set of open sorry um sort of pre-built template courses that you can just copy uh and when you copy one of those courses it brings in everything that the creator has created which will vary from course to course depending upon what the individual uh people did um i'll show you one this is one from one of my books uh pre-calculus book um and so we are a bit more learning management system. Uh, so it, we, you don't have to use it this way. Um, it can, my open math can be used integrated with an LMS or it can be used standalone as its own um, sort of learning platform. Uh, so in here and a lot of our courses, what you'll find is, is um, content organized aligned with the book. So like here's chapter two and in chapter two, here's a section and here's a link to the OER textbook, uh, in this case, the PDF. Um, oftentimes there'll be a set of sort of videos, in this case, overview videos that are meant to, um, you know, help the student if they miss class or if you're teaching online, provide some video resources. By the way, in that, in our template courses, there are some that are sort of more set up like this one for face-to-face -face classes. There are some that are also more designed uh, as sort of ready to run online courses. Uh, so they're actually sort of both available. And then there's the actual homework sets. Um, and the homework sets, um, like most of them, most systems nowadays are algorithmically generated. So each question is getting slightly different versions. Uh, the questions are all created by <coughs> faculty, like I said, um, and then shared um, variety of question types. You have sort of your numerical questions and, um, you know, like, uh, um, Gavin was showing, you know, similar kind of sort of equation enter, equation editor based entry to make it kind of easy for the student to enter. Um, if they get it wrong or just want to do more practice, they can ask for a new version. It will generate new problems uh, for them to work on. There's also sort of, you know, your standard question types like multiple choice and matching, uh, and then also things like uh, graphing, uh, so we can. You know, practice graphing uh, an equation, uh, and we can put in, you know, equation or function type answers as well. So a wide variety of question types. Um, a lot of the questions have video resources attached. I don't know if this is going to pop up or not because of the way I shared, but uh, the, the, you know, when a student clicks this, it pops open a video um, that the teachers identified as being relevant. Uh, and, and then the student can watch that for additional practice if they want to. 
Um, like I mentioned, it, it can be used as a standalone LMS. And in that context, in addition to being able to post up um, you know, files and videos and links and your assignments, uh, there's also you know, messaging and forums. Uh, and when used this way, that sort of integrates into the system. So you can have options for buttons like message my instructor, or in this case, post a forum, which will take the question and put it into a forum post. Um, I really love this for my online classes because then a student can ask a question and I know exactly what the question is. I don't have to go digging for it. Um, plus, if any other students click on that post a forum, uh, it'll say, someone already posted about this. You should go read that. Uh, and then I'm not getting you know 20 messages about the same problem. Uh, they can just go read the uh, response I've already posted. Um, being open, of course, everything is uh, remixable and customizable. So, um, you know, if you have a course that doesn't quite match up with something we have, you can always mix and match from multiple courses. Um, you can, you know, if there's topics you don't cover, of course, you can delete them, uh, rearrange things. Um, and of course, all the assignments are customizable. Um, in addition, um, again, the, the sort of pre-built homework sets are meant to provide an easy start because um, uh, one, of the you know, one of the biggest challenges we find with switching to OER is um, things aren't as prescribed, right? <laughs> so things aren't, don't tend to be sort of as pre-built. And so we wanted to give people an easy start. Uh, but if they want to dig in further, uh, we do have um, at this point, at least tens of thousands, about hundreds of thousands of questions ranging in topics from arithmetic to differential equations, um, as well as now some physics and, and, and uh, chemistry and engineering and even accounting, uh, oddly enough, it works. Uh, and, uh, and, and so if a teacher wants more questions, they can dig into the question libraries and find uh, you know, additional questions. Uh, and of course, a, they also have the option to write their own uh, or, or modify existing questions uh, to customize them. Yeah, and that's the gist of uh, my open math. Excellent. Does anybody have any questions for David about my open math? So a general question, which is, is there a limit on the resources that you're able to provide to uh, institution? At this point, we have not had a need to put on any limits. Um, and uh, yeah, no one, no one has gone sufficiently crazy enough. The only thing that would really be an issue is if someone wanted to run like a, you know, really huge, like live simultaneous, everyone's running, you know, hammering it all at the same time thing. But even then it, it, it would be unlikely to be an issue. Right now we're running about 250,000 students um, at any given time. And so, yeah, we're not going to, you know, adding a, another few hundred students uh, from an institution is not going to be a big deal. And it looks like we have a question in the chat. Are there business calculus problems? Yes. Yeah, there is. Um, I mean, I can't say how wonderful they are in terms of their business contexts, but there, there are, um, we do have at least one uh, business calculus course that's that is sort of ready to, you know, ready to copy. Um, and I think there are additional business calculus questions as well. Great. So I had a few questions that can be directed to any of you. Um, so the first is just um, in terms of commercial products, I was hoping that you could kind of speak to the, some of the limitations of some of the commercial project products that are available and why it's so important to replace them or to have an alternative to, uh, to some of the, you know, some of the platforms that are provided by the textbook publishers. I have a hard time speaking bad at them because frankly, most of them do a pretty nice job. Um, I, I mean, I think the biggest downside of using a commercial product is lock-in um, that you, you know, particularly if you do your own work in there, if you are writing your own questions or, or doing a lot of work building courses, you are locked into that platform and you never have an option to, 
you know, if they jack up their prices, you know, 200%, you're still sort of stuck there because uh, you can't take your content and go anywhere else. I think, right, I have a, I, I, that is one concern that I have had, David, and I, I completely agree, um, is that there's a, you're losing control over um, sort of the educational materials that your students have and, and what the work they're producing. Um, but I've also had a really significant trouble with the cost. I mean, the, they tend to not look like a huge amount per student, but they are, I mean, even 30 or $40 seems like a lot to me at this point. And the number of students that we're cranking through there, we're giving those publishers a tremendous amount of money. Um, there's sort of a nice feature that many of them will have, as my own math does, direct links from the problem to the textbook. Right, and so that piece feels, if you're using the textbook already, that seems like that is actually a, a benefit. Um, but the the cost and the lock-in to me are really um, problematic. And my experience with the actual systems and the problems is that the quality varies really, really dramatically. And I think some of them are much better now than they were. <laughs> there were a number of them that initially not only were the problems horrible but the actual grading of the problems was horrible um, and so there were just fundamental issues with how well they were able to assess whether the student did the problem correctly um, i think they've improved dramatically since then but it it made me gun shy right from the outset um, with those things and especially i'll add if the questions are horrible and some of the systems don't give you the ability to modify anything or fix anything. So even if you run into something that's bad, you don't have any recourse. We have a comment in the chat that says we're switching from basic Alex to inclusive access Alex, and it's still far too expensive. Um, we have quite a push at the University of Iowa too to, to use inclusive access for some of these systems. And you know it does bring down the cost somewhat, but you still do have some of these other you know problems that you're talking about. And then Anne Marie says forty eight percent of our students reported not purchasing required text primarily due to cost. Cost matters, especially for students who are Pell eligible, non-white, international, and part time. Yes, very true, very true. Um, okay, so my next question um, is more of an open-ended one. Um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering what advice you might have for math instructors who really would like to, to adopt an open math system, but maybe don't have the departmental support or the university support. Is there, would you recommend sort of um, using these platforms for a single class, or would you try to focus your efforts more on trying to sort of advocate at the departmental level for adoption? <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, I, I personally have found that the most successful model for for getting a department on board is for that one sort of ambitious faculty member to just dive in and and obviously with department permission, you know, get their get their course using OER and an open math system and then show it to the department and say, hey, here's what I got now. Take a look at this. And now that I built it, all of you can just copy it. You won't have to do all that work. <laughs> and that's often, you know, sort of the easiest way to get, um, you know, to get people on board. I mean, obviously, the the other, the other trade off when going from commercial to OER is the faculty. There are some faculty who get really latched on to the support, um, the live support that publishers provide. Um, I think that's gone down a bit in the last many years um, as sort of the power of reps has gone down a bit. Um, but even then, I mean, I, God, I knew some faculty who would literally call support at the beginning of each quarter to ask the person to set up their course for them because they didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> and I mean, that's something that obviously an OER system doesn't do. Um, you know, sort of there has to be you know, self-support or or the department has to figure out how to support the department. And so again, having that one person who sort of figures it out and can then help their colleagues uh, is often the best avenue to drive departmental adoption. Yeah, but I think, I mean, as Bruce alluded, a lot of it depends on the department and knowing the culture and the politics that are there. Um, and so I think that it depends a lot on where you are. Um, I know that University of Michigan Dearborn 
um, started using WebWork because <laughs> we sent them a bunch of postdocs who are now faculty there. And they said, you know what, this is ridiculous. This system works really well. It'd be silly for us not to use it. Um, and then they came and negotiated with us and they actually now have a deal where we host all of their courses for what is really a bargain basement price. Um, and, but then they have somebody there who's going to try and do a lot of the overhead that David's alluded to of sort of making sure that people know what's there and having set up a bunch of template courses. And once that's in place, there is a very strong argument that you're saving not only time, money, but also time with these. Because if you, once you have the template in place, copying the template and building a new course is very little overhead and it removes a huge amount of work that the faculty member would otherwise be doing. Right. We have the extreme case of that where we have the luxury and I have the particular luxury of being in a position which is designated to support web work and other you know, related things in the department. But the effect of that position is that anybody who's teaching calculus in our department um, inherits a web work course with everything pre-populated, all the dates are set, all the students get added. They don't have to do anything at all to make that work. All they have to do is be able to answer the email when the student hits the email instructor button and says, I don't understand how to do this problem. Um, and so there's, it, it, there is a lot of cost to getting it going, but once you have it moving and you have the, some level of support structure in place, the amount of um, time and effort that faculty members are having to spend on this can actually drop off, I think, considerably. Do you see some institutions getting that support from their kind of central IT, or do you most often see that coming directly from the math department? So my, I have direct experience with very few institutions and in <laughs> I'm at one institution, I've been here for over 20 years somehow. Um, at here though, our support, actually the, the server support has moved from the department into the college. And so at this juncture, um, the department's actually not putting anything into managing a server and the college is subsidizing that on a, virtual machine that they have running around out there. Um, and then the departmental support is in the math side of it, trying to actually make the courses go um, on that. At Dearborn, I know they have a um, non -tenure track, continuing non-tenure track faculty member, part of whose role is to ensure that the large courses get the web work set up and everything is running. Um, and I don't have a good sense of a lot of the other models. I think a lot of places have a faculty member who enjoys it and just does it, which is actually a very good model if you have a faculty member who can do that and get tenure um, and not get penalized for it. So um, I was wondering too, uh, if you could talk a little bit about, this is uh, about web work specifically, if you could talk a little bit about your integration with LibreText. So I am not an expert on that. My um, understanding of how we talk with the uh, open textbooks is largely through the what we call a standalone renderer. So WebWork as a uh, package runs as an application on a web server that then manages student lists if it needs to, it manages homework sets, it manages all of this. And then there's a sort of a back end that says when the student hits the problem, it gets passed off to this renderer, which then presents the problem to the student. And the renderer has now been split off so that you can use that independent of the web work infrastructure itself. And so these OER um, resources that are, are using that to be able to say, I want to embed a web work problem in my textbook. Then all I have to do is make sure I've got the hook to the right API and I can talk to the renderer and I have to tell it what the problem is. Um, so Pretex does this either by saying you can tell it the name of a problem or the location of a problem in the actual library in WebWork, or you can give it WebWork code that gets then sent to the renderer. The renderer processes it and sends back the formatted version that the student can see. And if the student then fills it out and says, check it, then it gets sent back to the renderer, which knows how to check it and comes back and sends the information it needs back to, to, to market. Um, that's my, <laughs> the, more or less the extent of my understanding of the, of the interaction between the two. But uh, I, I can give you references if you're interested in finding people who know more about that than I do. Yeah. 
We did a webinar not too long ago about, you know, various OER platforms and we, we highlighted LibreText and it is sort of a complicated platform, but it seemed like their online homework questions that they had, their library was incredibly robust. And so, yeah, I would, I would recommend to folks to check that out. That, that, that's because Libra Text's library is WebWorks library and my open math library put together into one. <laughs> oh, we're, okay. We're using both of us as uh, <laughs> and embedding our content in, in Libra Text. I see. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, does anybody have any other questions? It looks like we have another one in the chat. Um, let's see. Suggest language. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Emery? Where I just um, sort of uh, have a visceral reaction to the publisher speak of quote inclusive access right so as we're you know that came up so I always have to mention I feel like the phrase inclusive access makes it sound like an all inclusive resort. Um, but when I spot check pricing for inclusive access textbooks not homework system access codes but specifically um, digital textbook rentals through inclusive access models. Um, I'm seeing four month access for, you know, $120 or more. Um, and that means the students won't ever be able to access that text after the course is complete. And so if we're expecting students to build on their knowledge, especially from introductory level courses, that ability is really gone in terms of being able to access that introductory text. So I hope that we can start to get away from the publisher language of quote inclusive access and call it what it really is, which is automatic billing. Yeah, I think that that's really um, a, a problem at University of Iowa too is that yeah we don't have perpetual access to a lot of these resources. And what we're finding too is like sometimes there'll be pretty significant discounts on the text, but the actual homework systems and kind of supplementary systems that are needed to teach the course aren't really discounted at all. And students have the ability to opt out, but it's sometimes not real transparent how they would do that. So yeah, there are lots of problems with the inclusive access model. Um, switching gears a little bit, I, I really like uh, the idea of a, an interested faculty member taking this on and then somehow getting tenure. So are there research studies? I mean, obviously there's online homework research education, like math education research, but is there a research community um, that could kind of dovetail with this if somebody was interested in being that person? You know, we have scholarship requirements at Drake that are, you know, definitely not as rigorous as Michigan or something. I mean, I, we value scholarship of teaching and learning, for example. Um, is there a community that's kind of active in this area? So let me make sure I'm understanding. Is it sort of a community who's active in the sort of research on the impact of these systems or yeah. on maintaining and yeah so certainly there there's a the art room community through which is loosely connected to MEA, i think at this point right it's certainly a very strong space where there are a lot of people that are very interested in this type of thing um, okay. so there, um, and so there certainly are a lot of people there's a um the MEA has a web sigma, which presumably should have also people, though that's been pretty quiet in the last, I think the people who started it, the leadership sort of, you didn't get the replacement people. And so it hasn't, I haven't seen a lot of activity in that, but okay. the room community is certainly very active and I'm sure there are people that are doing that. Okay, thank you. I might jump in here and mention too, the Iowa OER action team is um, and Mariah and I serve on that, um, among other folks from higher ed, um, as well as K-12 to, to kind of encourage this work statewide. Um, that team is working on some preliminary plans for disciplinary interest groups. If faculty are interested in getting together with other folks in similar disciplines to, to talk about what they're doing with OER, how to do more with OER, um, running into, you know, troubleshooting problem areas, those types of things. Um, hopefully there will be some statewide support for that. Okay. Odile, do you have a question? This is a much more specific question and I'm not sure I can even well pose it, but um, since, since there are people who know what they're doing here, uh, does anyone know of a, um, an, 
an OER homework system that is specifically compatible with a uh, math for elementary teachers kind of a class, because that's that's like a, a I, I, looking at all of these, I don't see that ever singled out as one of the options. And I don't know if there's a good reason for that that I just don't know about. I think one of the reasons is, is unfortunately, that's one course that there is just not the best OER for yet. Um, there's a book out of Hawaii that you may have seen that is pretty good, but it sort of only covers the first half of the course. Um, we do have a couple math for ed courses on my open math that people have shared, but I don't know how complete they are. Um, I have to take a look again. Sorry, I'll let Gavin. I, I was just going to see if I could see if there were problems for math for um, teachers courses in our library because the problem I have is it's not a course that I've ever actually taught. I was going to say, I know we have some questions for math for ed because uh, like one of my colleagues teaches math for ed using a commercial book, but using our open homework system. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just don't know if there's sort of a complete package or something fully OER alive yet. I think web work will be in much the same space. Uh, that there will be certainly be resources and problems that you could use and develop, but whether there's a, a sort of a more complete package out there, I'm not actually sure. That's a tough class to teach with online homework just in general. You know, I, I've kind of abandoned all that. I teach those classes at Drake and just to kind of a really negative reaction from a part of the students and um, it didn't seem to be working after trying for a couple of years, so. And the important questions for that type of course are gonna be essay questions and explain your reasoning. Yeah. Which computers don't grade. Right. We just have a, the, the way that we're set up is, such that our, our uh, ed department really wants us to, to make extra sure that we're hammering the, the content uh, mastery of, of, of the, the common core standards. And so like right now we have Alex supplementing uh, the you know stuff that you're talking about that is what, what actually it's, it's kind of like two different classes where the online portion is a separate thing. So I don't know if there's, it, it would be cool if I could magically keep that and have it be open. <laughs> questions for our speakers today. Well, thank you very much to the three of you for, for coming today and for everyone else for, for your excellent questions and for, and for coming. Um, I'm going to quickly paste in some links. Um, these are not like super hard to find, but um, I just thought I would give some information about Iowa OER action team. I, I have a quick question as you're <laughs> posting there. I didn't, wasn't able to unmute fast enough. Um, so we've been using commercial textbooks for our calculus class at UNI. And of course, there's really good problems in there that we've used. What rules are there to like translate a question from a textbook, you know, from a publisher and put it in one of these systems? Because I did use Edfinity for my trig class and I saw that there are commercial books so is it just you say this is from Hughes Hallett or well, what kind of rules are there if we were to get and create questions? How original do the questions have to be? I web work may have other rules because if you're hosting yourself, you can kind of do whatever you want as long. And if you're an official adopter of the book, it's probably fine. Uh, my open math rule is don't do it. We don't want anything that's commercially copyrighted. Right. And I think it's worth, if your plan is to create problems which are then being disseminated widely, then I would be very careful to check with the publisher first. Um, having said that, at least if you go back far enough, um, there are a very large number of problems from the Hughes Hallett calculus textbooks in web work. And the reason that is true is because I wrote them. And when I was doing this, I talked with our representative from Wiley and at the time, at least, Wiley felt that the um, problems were not something they could actually 
um, either they didn't want to or they couldn't manage the copyright on it. And so they actually sent me the tech source for every problem in the book and so that I could easily translate them into web work because they said their perspective was the more people that can use their textbook with the greater variety of homework systems, the better off they are. That was before they had Wiley Plus running around. So they may be less willing to do that now. But at the time, they felt that it was perfectly reasonable for somebody to be developing these resources in an open uh, problems bank because it meant that it was more likely that somebody would choose to use their textbook. Okay. Thank you. I haven't gone back to check again. Does anybody would still like it? But at this point, the problems are there, so it's hard to sort of argue with it. And there have been some actually publishers. Oh, shoot, I forget who it was. Might have been Pearson. Um, and we had a web work developer who was writing a textbook with the publisher. Um, and what they did is actually had problems that were open that are in the web work library, and then problems which they were sort of reserving and wanted, if you wanted these extra content, then you they wanted to charge a little bit extra so you could get those. It does bring up kind of interesting copyright issues. Um, considering, you know, that math problems are sort of factual in some ways, so wouldn't necessarily be copyrightable, but there may be something about their presentation or content that would be, and so. Yeah, I think yeah. one of the things that maybe getting some clarification from, you know, various you know, university count, you know, lawyers and the like or collectively getting some something established for this um you know would be useful um i mean every textbook has the you know teaches you how to take the integral of x e to the x who owns the copyright on that you know was is it long expired you know when uh there's a lot of canonical problems out there that you ask and so where what draws the distinction between a unique problem and a canonical problem i remember when i was trying to patent some stuff uh, as explained very clearly that you can't uh, patent mathematics. So, um, uh, which was interesting because the same division at the university was pressuring me to patent and stuff and, and was also telling me the different wing of them was telling me well, you can't do this. So it was kind of, so I, I uh, it is, yeah, it's something that I think there's probably more leeway. Um, it's whether, uh, uh, remember, a patent or a copyright is a license to sue. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you'll win the suit. Um, and so, you know, if you put some stuff in and you change some words, it, it, you know, change the letters. If someone asks for something and, you know, the, the dependent variables T and independent variables Y, change it to S and X. And, you know, you have a, <laughs> that's now a, a new, <laughs> that's now a new problem, you know, by, by the very, you know, limits of copyright law. So, uh, but yeah, it would be useful to know uh, what we could just upload to these databases. Uh, as long as I've, we always literally heard, I've always heard it described that if it's sort of a generic math problem, like find the integral of this, you know, do this, you know, add these rational expressions, of course, that's not copyrightable, right? The things you have to worry about are like the application problems, the word problems, um, where there's specific wording in a specific order, then then that might be hit the realm of copyrightable so you know the, the interesting stuff is where you have to worry about copyright the boring stuff you don't yeah, the story so, yeah. problems word problems yeah so if you want to if you want to you know code the questions out of the book that are just the static you know the boring problems and probably randomize them at the same time that so they're different yeah go for it but you know what we don't want is something where you can take a unique phrase, stick it in Google and find the commercial book, right? <laughs> that's, that's where you really run into problems. I will share one anecdote from Deborah Hughes Hallett, who's the primary author on the Wiley textbook that we use. Um, she said, <clears throat> in their opinion, it was very clear that many other publishers were just simply taking their problems and they would show up in the next edition of the next book that the other publisher released. And of course, it's very difficult to prove that because these are factual applied problems and anybody else could conceivably have gone out and find the found the data and written a very similar problem to the one that shows up in the Hughes textbook. However, she said there was one case where they were pretty sure because they had a typo in one of the data sets and they said they watched this typo migrate from their book to another book <laughs> to another book to another book, at which point they said if they'd done the research and had written the problem themselves, they probably wouldn't have made the same type of, right? Um, so 
it, I, I agree. I would definitely check with legal counsel before I verbatim copied problems out of a textbook. My suspicion is that if you made some changes, it would be very difficult to be suited for it. Interesting questions, all these copyright things. Um, but I, we're at noon now, so I'm going to wrap things up. But um, but thanks again to everyone for showing up. And we'll be posting this uh, video on our YouTube channel probably by the end of today. That's thanks awesome. again, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. It was fun to get back to Iowa, at least virtually. <laughs> yeah.